Hey everybody, Adam back with another episode of the Bow Hunter Chronicles podcast. And today, um, this is a topic I think that a lot of people maybe are nervous about. Maybe they don't know where to start. Maybe they're afraid of the cost. Uh, but we're going to talk about DIY out of state hunting, um, kind of with a purpose and on a budget. And we're talking with uh, Blake Mallory. And, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we're doing this on zoom so we can see, uh, the wall of mounts and deer and all sorts of stuff Blake's got behind him, but, uh, he has literally written the book on how to destination hunt deer on a budget. So, um, how are you doing tonight, Blake? Good, good. Excited to be on and excited to talk about hunting at any time. So it seems like for, for most of us talking about hunting is probably more, I mean, I guarantee if you asked our wives that it would be like, it's all we talk about. Right. So, I mean, now, now you're getting to do it like in an official capacity, like honey, I have to go downstairs and talk about hunting now. Like, Oh yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. And still get the eye rolls every time we talk about hunting with them. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of nice to be able to have an excuse to talk about it. So what's your story as far as like, where are you from and how did you grow up hunting? Yeah. So, uh, I'm from uh, West Michigan. Um, we had a family cabin up in uh, uh, um, Northern Michigan and uh, basically, you know, grew up uh, shooting spikes and four points to six points with the family um, on the, uh, the family cabin. Um, and uh, probably around about 16 years old, uh, my family um, started to, one of my uncles um, started to put together uh, uh, hunting in Canada. And uh, we kind of uh, um, started to hunt in Canada and then uh, we did it with a guide one year and then we kind of started to do our own thing. And then uh, when I was about 20, um, 21, somewhere in there, we, uh, um, there was a big winter kill up in Canada and the deer hunt got real slow. And uh, I was just like, there's got to be other options because that was all we knew about hunting outside of the um, state of Michigan. And uh, so I started to, uh, um, really look into other avenues um, about hunting other places. And the first hunt I ever put together, I would say it was probably about 21, um, was a bow hunt into Ohio. Um, so that was about 15, 16 years ago now. And uh, it was uh, it was pretty nerve wracking putting together a hunt for, uh, you know, uncles and um, all the guys that were older than me. And um, but uh, that's kind of where it stemmed from. Um, you know, just grew up hunting around farms around my house and uh, the family cabin up north. Okay. So I look at things from a perspective of like, do I really want to subject myself to that? Right. And so there's hunts and I actually had a conversation about this with my wife about like hunting Africa. Right. So She's like, well, you're just out there and they're just pointing stuff out and then you're just shooting it. And I'm like, well, it's a target rich environment. You know, you're getting a lot of experience. Maybe you've never been to Africa. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different factors that come in. We got a podcast with uh, our friend, Billy, uh, talking about going down there and hunting out of a saddle and killing things in Africa and everything that goes with that. But it doesn't really do anything for me. And I would say that maybe Canada's like that for me too. And like in the book, you talk about like Canada being like a hunt where maybe you see one deer and freeze your balls off and mm. like uh, all of these things. And like, so was your experience like from the get go um, that great as far as like, was it like big deer or what kept you going after that? Because it seems like that would be a hunt where, it would re you'd really have to be like a serious hunter or it would have to be like something, some sort of a, a catalyst to be like, now I need to do this a lot. Cause it, it's from what I've seen from my, my friends that have done it, you know, it's like you sit in a blind, there's like freaking a bale of alfalfa out there and you yeah. wait to see like what com comes in. Right. Yeah. So you, you, you say hunt Canada and that's what you think of. That's not, 
that is not what we did. It was, um, it's one of the roughest hunts. So like the year we got, we're with a guide, we're talking, there's a lot of definitions of hunting with a guide. Uh, this is a very uh, marginal hunting with a guide situation. This was a, a platform nailed to a tree back on public land and you got a bucket and went and sat in it all day from sun up to sundown and you might see a deer. Um, that was basically the hunting with a guide there. So no bail hay, no, no, none of that. Not seeing, you know, letting three bucks walk and picking which one you want to kill. That was not the situation. Um, that's why we kind of went there, did that. Uh, we were successful. Uh, we, we shot four for four, I think, you know, a couple one thirties. Um, I think mine was like 110. I was, uh, I was 16. It was the last day. Um, but then we, we kind of basically looked into it and this is Ontario. And uh, we, we decided that we could kind of do this. And we got hooked up with a, a with a guy up there that had a cabin and uh, we kind of knew some of the area. So we'd go up there and we'd scout for a couple of days before we started hunting. Um, the thing that brought us back was we did run into 170s. Um, we did shoot a couple 170s, a couple 150s. I think I, I shot one that was just about 160 up there. So when you did connect, that, that was what kept you on stand for so long. I mean, basically up there, the one thing is, is 10 to 2, that's when you're going to kill your big ones. You're not going to kill it right before dark. You're not going to kill it first thing in the morning. Um, but uh, it, was, uh, it was one of the hardest hunts. I mean, when I started hunting other places, going to Ohio, was like hunting in paradise. Um, you know, see deer consistently, um, higher deer numbers. Um, I want to say like in the area that the locals were saying like seven out of 10 deer die without ever seeing a human in those areas. Um, and there's just so few deer numbers in the area that we were hunting, but that was, you know, I took a lot of that into when I set up hunts and stuff is basically, you know, how hard you're willing to work at something is how successful you're going to be. And same thing with up in Canada. If you were willing to say, you know, if you didn't get down at noon and go eat a sandwich, you had a high, lot higher chance of killing a big buck up there. But yeah, it was brutal. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, but when, when it was this heyday, you know, we, we had one trip, I think we had eight or nine guys and we all tagged out. Um, the last guy came down the last day, but we, everybody filled the tag. And so it was, it was, it was pretty good hunting. Um, even though it was brutal at times with how cold it was. So talk to me a little bit about that, because when, for most people in Michigan and the way that you've outlined that saying, you know, we shot spikes, four points, six points, and then we went to Canada. Um, you know, that if, if that 110 inch buck was the first buck that you saw, you probably would have shot him in heartbeat if you had never seen anything else. I mean, the first time I went to Ohio, they, we went and scouted Ohio. We saw some deer running around, but they're like, Oh, there's one fifties. There's big deer down here. You know, we saw some one thirties, one forties, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Oh, you know, cool. But I, in my mind, I couldn't quantify that. Right. And yeah. so the first deer that I saw on stand in Ohio was 110, 115 inch, 10 point. And I was like, Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right. I can see, I can see how this, this would be fun. Um, so to go to a place where, I mean, I can tell you that myself, I think I've probably seen a 170 or a 180, you know, in the dark driving back in Ohio. Um, I've seen two deer that were just, I mean, yeah. mind blowingly huge. Um, but to see something like that on stand after going from shooting spikes and four points and six points. And I think that that's where a lot of our listeners are like you, it's hard to put that into perspective, like to, to see one of those and to see one on the hoof, you know? Yeah. So the, the one thing is, is that I was on, like, I grew up watching my dads and my uncles and my, my grandpa shooting, you know, one horn spikes, four point six points. Um, I was right on that tail end when I got started in hunting. Um, cause when, when I got started hunting, you know, it wasn't, we could start hunting when we were five, six, seven, whatever they are now. Um, it was 12. I could bow hunt for 12 and 13 and I could start gun hunting when I was 14. Um, and so I would say about when I was about 14, 15 is when we really started to actually 
we were kind of starting to turn the corner slightly into, you know, bigger six points or eight points, um, four points on one side, um, that kind of thing. So I had started to shoot decent deer around that time I was going to Canada. Um, so it wasn't that big of a jump, but however, had I have seen a 180 while I was on stand in Canada that first year, I would have fell out of my tree that, but that didn't happen. Um, actually that first year I went to Canada, I hunted sun up, sundown from Saturday to Friday. And I saw legs of one deer. It was like on Tuesday, um, at noon, I never even saw his head and then I saw the deer I shot on Friday, which was a small 110 inch eight point. Um, and I almost didn't shoot it. I, I had it right underneath me. I was going to let it go. And my dad's like, I would have kicked your butt if you would have let that go. Cause we've been hunting our tail off. And I was the last one. The other guys had all shot. Um, and I was 16. So everybody was happy for me and everything like that. And at that time, I mean, I still had shot quite a few bucks, but, um, I, you know, it, it, I, I went to Canada to look for a 130 and I, I didn't connect, but I knew they were there. I mean, some of the guys that were in camp were from other places and stuff. And there was 150s, 160s, 170s hanging on. I think one guy did shoot a 180. He was definitely the VIP of the camp. Uh, you could tell the guide had his hand a little bit more all day and he was bouncing around and they were on some big deer. Um, but uh, that's that's really the only guided hunt I've ever done. Um, and uh, I, I guided after I graduated from Grand Valley um, in natural resource management. Um, I guided um, myself, turkey and whitetail. And uh, um, that's where really going from, you know, seeing 110 or 130 inch deer and knowing if it's 110 or 130 inch deer really turned the corner for me. Cause I had to know how to age deer on hoof and score deer on hoof. Um, so there was a lot of that, that, uh, really I, I learned there's one of the senior guides that I learned basically every, almost everything I know about deer hunting to this day, I learned from that guy. Um, but, uh, that's where things really turned, but yeah, it was, I mean, you, you bring up a good point. I never thought about it that bit way is going to Canada, hunt for seven straight days and seeing one deer, like why would anybody, you know, want to do that again? But, uh, for some reason I did, I, um, I went, I think I hunted Canada five or six times. Um, and I still to this day, I got one buck that is, um, probably the, uh, actually he's right there on the video. Um, he's, uh, just under 160. He's my top two bucks I've ever killed. Um, and I shot him at 1230 on a rainy freezing rain day freezing my tail off I didn't think there was any chance I was going to make it all day I was going to have to go back to the truck because I was it was one of the most blistering cold days I've been hunting and I was wet to the to boot so um but uh it uh it it makes me appreciate a lot of these other states that I go to where you know I might see a dozen bucks in a week or um, I think in the book, I talk about the, the first trip I took to Iowa. Um, I saw 85 different bucks in uh, 16 days of hunting. Um, and so, yeah, it, it definitely makes me appreciate a lot of these other hunts that I put together. So that's one of the things I wanted to talk about was the, um, like, a, a, along with your hunting background, you know, so you did some guiding, you did some uh, taxidermy, you still film and you put out a couple of DVDs and, and things like that. So what's the process for becoming like a guide? Um, <laughs> honestly, it's, uh, it's pretty loose. Uh, people think that, you know, you need to go to guide school. You need to know this. Uh, really, you need to get uh, paid very, very poorly and be willing to work your tail off for about 18 hours a day. Um, and that's what it came down to. Uh, the when I guided, uh, I was low man on totem pole. Um, when so, I so real quick though, like, how do you get into it? Like, so if you don't have to go to guide school or whatever, do you just like start printing off some business cards and say, Hey, I'll take you to, well, if, <laughs> if you want to guide for yourself, you, there might be different avenues to go to, but if you're guiding through some type of outfitter, uh, you give them a call and you're willing to work and you're willing to work for dirt cheap, they'll hire you. Um, that's basically what it comes down to. Um, when I interviewed with the place that I guided for, it was like, you know, can you lift a 50 pound bag? 
you willing to work hard? I mean, and then, uh, then basically I got trained for about three weeks on how to uh, score deer, um, how to age deer on the hoof and still like, you know, people think that they're experts on that. I worked with the experts who had been doing this for years and they still got that stuff wrong on a daily basis. Um, and there were still arguments about whether a deer was three and a half or five and a half, um, on a daily basis. But, um, really, I mean, if you want a guide, you know, start when you're 18, uh, and, uh, move out West. And, uh, I've got actually a buddy who's doing that right now. He works for a guide out in Iowa and Kansas, and, uh, he's, he's busting his tail and he, he's, uh, he's learning quickly on what it is. You know, it's a lot of, uh, hanging sets, um, a lot of, uh, holding, uh, rich people's hands and, uh, gutting deer for people as well. So, I mean, there's, uh, um, it's not a, it's not a glamorous life. Uh, the one thing is, is I did it. I, I love guiding turkey hunt. That was, that was a whole different ball game with calling and stuff. And I'm sure elk guiding is a lot different as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I love to hunt so much that you were working, you were, you were making a living during hunt season. And there was, there was very, very limited time. I think I got to hunt for, uh, about two weeks and it was in late December of that year is all I got to hunt. And, uh, I actually put together a Ohio muzzleloader hunt because that was right after Christmas and we were done guiding about the 20th of December. And, uh, so, um, yeah, my, my guiding background, it's, uh, you know, I, I ran a lot of corn feeders, uh, you know, I ran a lot of, uh, you know, checking fences and, uh, running coyote traps. And, um, yeah, I, I guided probably, I want to say about eight or nine bucks that we got killed, um, some decent ones and, uh, um, had a successful Turkey hunt that I guided. Um, but, but short of that, it was, uh, it wasn't anything I was going to write a book on, uh, or, you know, that that's, uh, you know, it seems, it seemed, and it seemed awesome. It seemed like what I wanted to get into until I actually, I actually dove into it, but I, I like to hunt too much to, uh, to go down that Avenue is where I basically put it when I, when I decided to stop. Well, I just want to put it in context because, um, there's some things that you talk about in the book that I would never have thought of. And like I said, we, you know, we talked prior to this and the people that listen to the podcast have, you know, probably heard I've hunted a few out of state DIY type stuff. And it's not what, you know, it's who, you know, and you know, you meet that guy in the bar, or you meet this guy yeah. here, and then you, you get on this piece of property, whether it's public land that they hunt squirrels on and it's, you know, got a lot of deer, they push a lot of deer around squirrel hunting, or they got a hundred acres that, you know, nobody ever hunts or my mom lives on our family farm and we quit hunting and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but again, like when people say like, I'm a hunting guide or I was a hunting guide or, you know, you kind of laid it out. Like, you know, I could, I could guide people on my property in the UP because I, I've filled a corn feeder and I've yeah. d- done a lot of the things that you outlined there. Um, but I would call myself not a guide. So it's interesting to, to think about. Maybe I think of more when you talk about a hunting guide in your mind, you have like the grizzly hunting guide with, uh, you know, the, the backup shotgun and uh, yeah, know, all, and, all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, and that, and that's, and that's completely different. Like um, I, I swear, I think it's like down in uh, like Pike County, um, Illinois, apparently like when I started doing a lot of research and stuff, they said basically anybody who owns 10 acres is an outfitter um, because everybody was a destination that everybody wanted to go to Pike County, Illinois, because they were started killing big deer. And uh, I guess there's bumper stickers that goes around and says, save a deer, shoot an outfitter. Um, you know, <laughs> like anybody can call themselves a, a guide and, you know, and, and it's unfortunate because there's a lot of guys that, you know, they're like, okay, I live in Michigan, you know, I want to go on an out of state hunt and they don't know, you know, who do you trust? How how do you, how do you know that you go to this outfitter and it's not some, some guy who's got, you know, some 50 year old ladder stand um, made out of wood inside a tree that's like, yeah, we used to kill deer back there, you know, give me $2,000 and good luck. See you next week. 
uh, you know, that's, you know, you, you, you drop that kind of money, you know, your, your expect, your expectations are a lot higher. Um, and that's where, um, I, I was very fortunate. And I talk about in the book of the first hunt that I put together, I had a guide, uh, an outfitter actually in Ohio. So what I did was I, I basically got on all these forums and I, I got on all these websites. And I basically put into the, these, these, uh, these questionnaires, um, that, I was like, you know, I don't really want you to hang a stand for me. I don't even need a place to stay. I just kind of looking for a piece of land and nobody for months reached back to me. And then I finally had one guy in Ohio reach out to me and we talked, we ended up talking for like two weeks. Um, and he was really, really cool. And he basically let me know that, um, with a lot of these outfitters that start to get a little bit bigger, they never turn down a lease. They, you know, if a piece of property comes up to lease, they take it because they're hoping to expand and grow and, and get more clientele. Well, some of these uh, leases are so far away. They never have any, they never have time to scout them. They never have time to hang sets. Um, they just kind of keep them in their back pocket to always have. And that's where I kind of developed uh, my view on, talking with outfitters on how to get uh, some of these pieces of property and stuff. And uh, he ended up leasing a uh, piece of property that he never had anybody hunt because it was so far from the lodge. Uh, gave it to me really cheap. Um, we went down on Thanksgiving week uh, with Thanksgiving right being right in the middle of the week because nobody really wanted to do that. Everybody spend time with their families and whatnot. Um, and then he actually even hooked me up with a place to stay um, like an Airbnb kind of thing. And uh, it ended up working really well. The guy passed away before we came down there, uh, but he gave me a lot of insight on how to deal with these outfitters. Um, and when I'm looking for what, how I want to hunt, like I really don't, for me, I, I have nothing against somebody wanting to go sit in a box blind with a bale of hay in front of them and, and rifle through a bunch of deer and let, you know, shoot the fifth buck that walks through. I don't have a problem with that. We're all on the same team. Um, I like to do a lot of the stuff my own. I, I just, I, I don't like uh, I don't like going somewhere where they're like, oh, you can only shoot a 135. And, you know, I, I don't want to be thinking about that when I'm looking down the barrel of a gun or looking at my bow sight, looking through my peep sight. Like that, that's not what I what I really want to look at. Um, so that's why a lot of this stuff, when I do hunt private land in other places, um, you know, I, I like to be able to do my own thing and, and uh whatever the hunt dictates, you know, I went to North Dakota, I shot a hundred inch eight point, but busting my tail and there was guys dragging out five points and four points. And, um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that was what was getting shot in the area. And I was, it's still one of the bucks I'm most proud of kill it off the ground. And, you know, it, it doesn't always come down to antler size for me. It comes down to experience and, and, uh, the story of the whole trip and what it comes together. So, um, but yeah, that's just kind of the insight of with outfitters and, you know, almost anybody can become a guide or let me rephrase that. Anybody can become a guide just depending on how you want to do it. But anybody can call themselves an outfitter if they've got, you know, 40, 50 acres, it's just, they might not be a good one. So, and that's kind of where I was going with this. And, you know, to this point, the, the listener, they, they're saying like, what the hell, man? Like you're talking about guides and outfitters and we're trying to figure out how to do this DIY on a budget um, type stuff. And so have you used that strategy of hunting um, unused outfitter land since that one? And if so, how it, I, I almost feel like as technology has progressed and things have changed, like the forums have almost gone away, uh, you know, to, to some degree, you know, everybody wants to just do everything on Facebook and uh, Instagram and all these different avenues. So if you say, so let's say that same Ohio hunt, like today, how would you go about trying to secure some private land if you were going to do that? So I actually did it. Uh, I think it was three years ago. Um, and, uh, my buddy ended up shooting a nice nine point and I misfired with a muzzle loader on a, on a drop time buck. Um, basically Facebook. Uh, so, you know, I'm always looking for leases or, you know, um, any, anything that says lease or hunt for sale or, you know, um, 
hunting land, um, any kind of those avenues. And the, the one tip that I give in my book is that, um, you know, be willing to walk away. You know, you're not tied to anything. There's always public land down the road. You're going to work harder, obviously, if you're on public land. Ohio, you can bait um, late season come, you know, muzzleloader season. In Ohio, Just on private on land, private. Though, right? Yeah, if private. you're on private. And so you can't do that if you're on public. So obviously right there, I mean, you know, it gets a little harder. There's less cropland on public than, you know, so if you're late season hunt food source, you know, it gets a little bit easier uh, to hunt private. But being willing to walk away, what happened was uh, three years ago, Ohio muzzleloader hunt, um, saw a thing popped up. I think, I think it was like 1500 bucks a guy, two guys on a pro this property, uh, DIY hunt. And I called them up and, uh, basically I said, um, I think it was 400 bucks. I said, I'll give you 400 bucks a guy to hunt the muzzleloader. And I said, I tell you what, I go, you can wait to the last minute and call me back if you don't fill it, you know, to them, 800 bucks is better than nothing. Um, again, out of your property. And he ended up not even getting off the phone with me. He, he took it right there. So we went from three grand to 800 bucks on the same piece of property, um, that we were going to hunt. And we ended up shooting one. It was still a tough hunt. Um, it wasn't the easiest hunt, but, uh, um, I, I did the, I did the same thing, um, with the one, the first one that I put together, you know, I talked to, with the outfitter and I said, you know, what's, what's a week that is still going to be halfway decent. Like everybody wants to go November 7th to November 14th. You know, you got rut going on. This was Thanksgiving week. Nobody wanted to hunt it. They can't fill it. Um, so we got it a lot cheaper. Um, I called another one and, uh, they, I called about muzzleloader and he told me it was like 1800 bucks a guy to hunt this piece of private. And I said, I was like, you and I are on completely different worlds. Like, I'm like, we're, we're not going to spend that. And, uh, we started talking and I was like, well, what about late archery season? Well, in Ohio, you know, archery goes into February and, uh, he's like, I don't have anything. He goes, I tell you what, he goes, you can hunt any of my properties for 250 bucks a guy and you can hunt as long as you want. I'm like, Sounds good. So I'm like, now you're talking my, now you're talking my language. So we, you know, there, there's just, if you're willing to work, do a little bit of extra work and you're willing to walk away and not actually secure something, um, you know, there, there's opportunities out there for somebody, but yeah, Facebook, I use, uh, I, honestly, the only reason I even have Facebook is for hunting stuff. Um, otherwise I wouldn't even have it. Um, uh, but there, there's avenues out there, Craigslist, um, I, I got a guy who I don't even know. I don't know who he is or what he really does, but I've had him call me and he gives me least possibilities in all these uh, places. And I've, I, I, I've literally counter, he tells me the price and I tell him uh, you can cut that in half and I'll think about it. And he goes, let me talk to the owner and he'll call me back and be like, all right, well, there was one, I was about ready to secure it in. And he called me back and told me that 14 bucks had been killed off the property. And I was like, I'm good, man. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do some other Avenue. That's a little bit too much hunting pressure for the year. And it was a late season hunt too. So, but that's the other thing too, is if you're looking for that rut hunt beginning in November, yeah, you, you're probably not going to get a discount um, with any of these outfitters. If you're, if you're looking for early season or late season, especially when these guys are basically tapped out, they don't have any clientele coming in. Um, that's when you can kind of uh, do that stuff. But like I said, I'm a big public land guy. You know, a lot of these places I go, I do the public land stuff. Um, very mobile. Even a lot of times we're mobile on where we stay just because we don't know if the area is going to be that great or not, if we haven't scouted it in the, in, in the past. And uh, so I always look down those avenues, but it doesn't mean that that's the avenue I'm going to take. Like we're, we're leaving for Kansas on Friday. Uh, we actually, the funny thing is, is we actually do have a, I've got two numbers of private guys, but because I've hunted the public land around there and ran into these locals and, you know, and sat and had a conversation with them. There's one guy who he kept driving up and down while we were hunting this piece of public, which is we out there, which is private land that's open to the public. And he, uh, he ended up waving us down and started talking to us 15 minutes later. We're riding around in his pickup truck. He's showing us up all his private property. And he's like, you know, if you guys want to hunt this, go ahead. And it's like, you know, that's, that stuff doesn't happen on a daily basis. So 
uh, that's why I always, I always welcome talking to the locals or like you said, the local guy in the bar says, ah, I got a hundred acres down the road that you can hunt whenever you want. No one hunts it. And, you know, I actually got a phone call today from a guy in Iowa that I ran into three years ago. I killed my Iowa buck on his property this year and I hit a buck on, uh, public and it ran on the private in Iowa, you can legally go on the private and track your wounded animal. Um, you just can't bring your weapon with you. Me being from Michigan, that just didn't feel right. It just didn't sit right. The guy I could see the guy's tree stands. I could see his box blinds. I knew he was a hunter. So I tracked the owner down while, while I was tracking the owner down, I ran into some guy on a dirt road while I was going back there. And I told him the whole story. And he's like, you don't need to do that. You can just go get your deer. And uh, I said, yeah, it just doesn't feel right. He goes, you know what? He goes, you feel, you, you sound like a good guy. He goes, I got a 150 acre farm. You can hunt whenever you want. And he, I, I hunted it late season that Iowa cause I ended up not finding that buck. Um, and then I hunted it this year as well with my buddy. And uh, the guy called me today, he's coming to Michigan. He was going to see if I was in town and stuff. And so it's those relationships that you develop with, with these guys. And, you know, one of the rules in my book that I talk about is you just talk to everybody and anybody there. You never know what avenue is going to take to put you on the next piece of beautiful hunting ground um, that you're going to have an experience of a lifetime in. So you touched on a couple of different things there. Um, one, so let's say you get that piece of property for 250 bucks or whatever for the late season, late archery. Do you feel, or I guess a better way to frame it would be, how do you combat the feeling of feeling like I paid for this, so I have to stay here? Um, you know, I, I feel like you would be more inclined, I guess you'd be less inclined to go to public or to, to bounce around if you paid money to hunt this ground, which may be a hundred acres or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. How do you, how do you combat that? Combat it by, you know, wanting to put yourself on deer. Uh, if I go down there and there's no deer there, I'm going to move on. And first and foremost, a lot of these properties, you know, e-scouting goes a long way and um, they're, there's a lot to be said. Yeah. You're not going to know any finer details. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to know that kind of stuff, but you know, I had hunted the area, the County in the past. And, you know, I, I had known that, but I'm never tied to a piece. I mean, you go hunt public land. If you're going solely hunting public land in another state, you're, you you know, you're not tied to that area. You might be traveling two hours, um, to go get on deer. And it's, you know, it's just like fishing. You, you're not getting bit, you, you move on. And, uh, same thing with deer hunting. And, and so and that's the other thing too, is if I, if I paid 1500 bucks or two grand, I'm, I'm going to hunt that property and figure it out. If I pay 250 bucks, all right, move on. Um, if, if I get there and strike out, um, I'm going to move on. I might throw, I might throw a trail camera on it and go for two days, go hunt something else on public and keep a scouting and venturing. Um, and, and come back and check it and see if I'm missing something that's going on there or not. But no, I I'm, I'm not tied to anything. Um, you, you can't be, I mean, if just because you've got a good stand on a piece of property, you know, you, you killed a buck there last year does not mean by any means, you know, it could get logged on the backside this year. You know, it, it doesn't mean, uh, you know, it's a guarantee and same thing with just paying money for it. And that's, that's kind of one of the things that's like, all right, can I afford to go on a $3,000 hunt? Sure. But do I want to pay $3,000 to go on a hunt? No, not at all. Um, I would, uh, I'd rather work a little bit harder for it and pay less and go on another $700 hunt down the road in the same season. Um, this year I've got six buck tags. I've got three filled so far and, uh, um, one, two, three, four, five different States, Michigan, we get two buck tags. So, um, you know, and I'm, actually toying with the idea don't tell my wife yet but uh, about going to Kentucky later this year so there's you know I, I'm I'm always looking for what what other experience can I have what other area can I go to you know even if I say I say I go to Kentucky and we strike out 
it's still a learning experience for maybe next year. I get it kind of dialed in a little bit more um, and we, and we get something figured out and it, it's a huge learning curve. I, I mean, I haven't shot a buck in Ohio, which is crazy, but I haven't shot a buck in Ohio. I was thinking about it the other day. I think it's been like eight years and I hunt it every single year. Um, and so it's, uh, and, and I have opportunities almost every single year, whether I let them walk or what I want to do, but, um, you know, every year it gets a little bit more fine tuned on, on higher probability of actually killing a deer, um, in all these different areas. So, so for the guys that are just starting out trying to do their first out of state hunt. So if you were starting your first out of state hunt today, knowing what you know now, how would you like walk us through the steps of, of planning that hunt from like time of year, budgeting, lodging, and we'll just for um, ease of the scenario, we're going to say that you're going to plan that quintessential rut hunt um, and kind of go from there. Um, but if you think that there's a better place or a better way to, to do that, where, I mean, cause I feel like the times that I've done it, it's been, okay, we're going to go, we're going to leave on thing. Um, not on Thanksgiving. We're going to leave on, um, Halloween. And then it's going to be, we're going to leave the week after. And then we run into guys and we run into guys and we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out. So, um, you know, like I said, knowing what you know now and in a guy's mind, he says, I want to go, I want to hunt the rut hunt. But in reality, what he's saying is he wants the most opportunities at deer of, of a certain caliber. Right. So, yeah, no, so, I, I get it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it comes down to is looking at your time off. I mean, family, you know, all of that kind of stuff that all comes kind of into play. When I first started doing this, November 15th was a holiday, you know, in my mind was a holiday in Michigan. So I wanted to be back by November 15th. I I've kind of gotten away from that for the time being, but you know, you, if you want to go for that rut hunt and typically with my hunts each year, so I'm, I'm hunting five different states this year, the best state that I'm going to hunt, I'm going to go during that rut week. Um, now, granted, with that being said, like you just said, when everybody plans a hunt, they're going from Halloween to November 14th, um, especially if they're from Michigan, that's when they're going. Um, some of these other states, like in, November, in, in Iowa, guys really don't even start hunting out there until after like the 12th, 14th, 15th. That's when they start uh, kind of breaking loose a lot of times with the, with the rut. But you're going to run into more pressure if you're hunting public land that way. Um, absolutely. If you're going to hunt private land with an outfitter or something along those lines, you're going to be paying top dollar. Um, that's just bottom line. Cause you're talking about the best, the best time to go. But a lot of that comes down to, you know, deciding on the time. And if you decide that ruts your, your time, the other thing that I would suggest is don't go outside. If it's your first time, don't go outside your boundary. If you're from Michigan, more than likely you're a stand hunter, you're a box blind hunter. You're, you know, you're not a guy who goes and covers 15 miles a day and tries to spot and stalk deer. Don't go out West, not for your first time. Um, just because hunt with what you're comfortable with, hunt within, with, within your means of what you know. And if you're going to hunt public land during that time frame, you know, as much as it, the, the cat's out of the bag with Ohio. I mean, yeah, 15 years ago, it was great. There was very few people down there. I, I've moved on from spots where I, I shot a six by six. I shot a 12 point down there on public land. And there, I, I, you can't even get a parking spot within two miles of the area at this point. And, you know, there's guys from Pennsylvania, New York, um, all over the place. And uh, so there's, there's something to be said about that, but the, the other thing, too, is if you're deciding that that's what you want to do, the time of starting to plan that is right now for next year. Like right now we're in December. You need to know where you want to go for next year. Um, we're going to be having that conversation with the guys that I'm going down to Kansas with on the trip down. We're going to be talking about what our options are for next year. 
Um, I've got points in for Colorado. I've got points in for Wyoming. I've got points in for Montana, uh, Kentucky elk. Um, you know, planning two, three years out is ideal. Um, and if you, if you want to put together a hunt next year, that's fine. That's great. And you need to start planning now. And, uh, the real reason I say that is the best time to scout is March, um, is go, go hunt, go shed hunt those areas. Uh, you know, you might not find a shed. That's not the point. Um, a lot of these areas like Indiana, um, they have a law. You got to pull your stands down in Michigan. You walk around public land, you see stand people stands all over the place. Same in Ohio. You see them all year round down there, even though I think you're supposed to pull them, but, um, you can go down there and nobody's hunting. You can see where the pressure has been throughout the year. Um, you can see old scrapes. Sometimes they're still active in February. I've seen that in March. Um, and you can see rub line, old rub lines. You can start getting an idea. And uh, February and March is such an overtime look um, for scouting. And if you can, like, it, obviously, like Kansas, it's a little bit too far. Um, Iowa's not far. Uh, Ohio's not far. Indiana's not far. Um, you can, you can make a weekend long weekend trip out of those scouting trips and, and kind of attack those. But, um, that's where that kind of comes down to. And then the other thing is too, is, you know, if you don't know what state you want to go to kind of set your budget, um, you got the one price I talk about in my book that you never get around is a tag. Um, you got to pay for that. And you also got to look to see if there's preference points that come into play, Ohio's over the counter, Indiana's over the counter. Um, you talk Kansas, Iowa, you need points. Uh, you, you know, you might not draw the first year. Um, but there's spots in Iowa where you can draw a gun tag every single year, but you can't draw an archery tag, um, which is really odd. But, uh, if you go gun hunt Iowa, you'll learn why. Um, but there's, there's all those kind of things that kind of come into play with what you want to do. And then if you, decide that, you know, okay, we're going to go to Ohio. We're going to go during rut and we're going to go scout in February and March. You basically kind of already got your game plan going. Um, at the end of March, then you kind of have maybe two or three areas that you really want to look at come um, before that rut. Uh, a lot of times what I'll do is Ohio. Um, I shot a buck on Indiana public land this year, but I, I had spent scouting it for two years and, uh, I only hunted in Indiana for one day this year, um, before shooting my buck. Uh, it was the first sit I had first morning I had, but that was two years of planning, um, with that. So a lot of that comes down to is you, you got those three areas, then you can start looking for lodging. Um, the earlier you lock things in a lot of times you get discounts with lodging. Um, and, uh, like, the spot we're going to Kansas, it's $95 a guy for eight days. Um, it, it's dirt cheap. I locked it in in March or, uh, I don't, as soon as Kansas came through that we drew, I locked it in that day. So all that kind of comes into play. And then the, um, you know, if it's Ohio and it's only a four or five hour trip, you know, you might want to think about, you know, late September going down and hanging cameras or even mid October where it gets a little bit closer um, we've done that, uh, be prepared for about 50% of them to get stolen SD cards getting stolen. Uh, a lot of times I take that as high hunting pressure in the area. Um, kind of gives me a little insight. Um, when I have a camera that's got good bucks on it and it hasn't been stolen or touched, you know, you're into something good. Um, and then, uh, and then when time comes, you go and actually do the hunt. And, uh, you know, you're, you're basically at a pretty low budget cost hunt for a couple of trips and, uh, not far from home. So one of the things you mentioned in the book, and you kind of didn't go into that there as far as planning, but, um, party size. So, uh, how many guys do you want to bring with you? Um, and I think it's really difficult, um, as I think anybody that really hunts hard or hunts a, a certain way, it's really easy to, you know, run into a guy who says, yeah, I hunt all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm a hunter too. And, uh, when you get to talking to him, you, you guys, maybe just like what you were talking about with the, the outfitter landowner, um, dollar amounts you know you're not on the same wavelength as 
what hunting hard is. Um, so in, in party size or how many guys to bring with you, um, how have you, what have you run into over the years? Yeah. So that's a great question. Actually, I kind of, I guess I completely missed that when putting together a hunt. That's uh, my, my first rule in the book is uh, who are you going to go with? Um, and a lot of how you're going to hunt depends on who you're going to go with. I've got buddies where, all right, this is going to be a fun hunt. You know, if I'm going with this guy, we're going to have fun. You know, we're not going to hunt extremely hard. This is more about a, a life experience is what's going to happen. Um, and I've got other guys like you're getting up at 4 a.m. You're going to bed at 830 at night because you're going to be exhausted. Um, the best that I've found is hunting in parties of two, uh, two to a truck. A, you know, you can go with six guys, take three trucks, go two, two and two. Um, if you, if you start to go with three in a truck, um, you start to run in, I, you know, three's a crowd. Um, you start to run into, okay, if you're hunt, if you're stand hunting, you know, there's always going to be the last guy picked up, uh, the first guy dropped off a little bit too early or, or something along those lines. If he shoots, then it's a, then it's a, a mess to try to get everybody coordinated, get the deer out some, you know, and, and you're on a, on a hunt, you know, so if a buddy shoots, yeah, you're, you're, you're pumped up, you're excited for them, but you also want, you know, you might be on a limited hunt where you're only hunting five days or you're only hunting six days and, and wasting a whole day to help someone track a deer, which you do. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you do. But if you're hunting in groups of two, you know, you and your partner are focused with yourselves. And so the best hunting trips I've taken, um, when we're going to Kansas, we're leaving on Friday, there's four of us, there's two in each truck. Um, this year it's actually, it's me and my dad and then my buddy and his son. Um, and we're going out there and when we go out there, we go our separate ways. Um, we're, we're still hunting as a team and figuring things out of how things are going, but they kind of got their areas that they go hunt. And, um, this is my fourth year out in Kansas this year, but, um, and we've got our areas that we're going to go focus on. So, um, when it comes down to it, you know, your whole trip is going to be, uh, determine whether it's successful if you shoot one or if you just have fun time or if it's completely miserable because of who you actually went with. So you, you want to be very mindful of who you're going on this trip with um, and, uh, and, and take that in consideration. Um, so I'm going on, on the trip with uh, my dad hasn't been to Kansas. He went the first year we went uh, uh, four years ago and we we're doing a ton of walking. Uh, we do about 15 miles a day. Well, uh, about Wednesday, um, five, six days into that hunt, my dad was just, he was toast. And, uh, now I've hunted out there a few times. I have a lot of spots that I can sit in the mornings and sit in the evenings and not just be constantly moving throughout the entire day. So I've got that already in that mindset already going with my dad that, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of sitting, um, when we're out there in Kansas, I've got these spots that, you know, I know deer travel through like the last time I was out there, you know, 11 o'clock, they were, there were still deer funneling in through this area. And, uh, and my dad's from Michigan, hunted Michigan his whole life, a lot more of a stand sitter. Let's grind this out. Um, actually in my book, I talk about grinders and finders. Um, like if I was going out with one of my best friends, Ryan, if we were going out there, we'd be on the finder mode and we'd be putting on that 15 miles every single day. And we'd be covering ground, covering ground, covering ground. Um, with my dad, I'm being very mindful that we're going to go out there and we're going to be a little bit more on the grinder side. Um, but with that being said, the pressure out in Kansas has been increasing a ton. So covering much more ground, a lot more ground every single day, you end up running into a lot more hunters last year with COVID. It was, it was nuts. There was more hunters out there than I've ever seen. Um, that was a third year out there and it was just, there was guys everywhere. So, so this is, um, like a tough place to ask this question. It's a tough, um, it is, um, very much like, a an anomaly, like an oxymoron to like ask this, <laughs> right. But like, I don't know where you're going with this. You're <laughs> kind of scaring me. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you've been uh, hunting out of state and doing this yourself for 
you know, the better part of two decades, you know, 16 yeah. years plus something is what, what I'm surmising. Um, how has um, social media, uh, podcasts, YouTube changed what you've what you found? You know, you, you kind of led into it there with like COVID, and, you know, and people having more time off. Um, but right now, uh, there are a couple of different camps, right? So there is, and you had said it earlier on that, uh, you know, we're all on the same team, hunt however you want to hunt. Um, but then there's the other part of it, like where the best example is like the ugly American, right? So there's the hunters that throw all their garbage out there. There's the hunters that, you know, walk past yet prime time and you know so there's a very not same team (laughs) attitude there um as well so uh how has that changed uh your uh, planning of your hunts and has it changed you know you you you'd mentioned you know you still want to be in your best state at the best date um but uh, has that changed pressure properties um, has it changed the best date, the best time, um, you, you know, as you've, as you work through this process? Yeah, honestly, what it's changed is how hard you've got to work, um, what it really comes down to. Uh, yeah, with social media, you know, you talk about the YouTube channels out there that, you know, the hunting public, you know, what are guys doing when they're watching that? They're trying to figure out, oh, did I see a street sign there? Uh, I saw an Onyx map. There was a river name on there. I, I just did it the other day on a hunt that I was watching. I saw a river name out in Kansas. I was like, is that in the area that I'm going? Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that the cat's out of the bag. And like I said, in Ohio, 15 years ago, Ohio was awesome. I mean, there was, yeah, there was still a lot of state hunters and there was still pressure down there. Um, but there, there wasn't the, the type of numbers that are down there. There's an area in Ohio that I won't even go anymore. And it was, it followed my steps that I lay out for going to a new state, looking at, you know, big buck counties, looking at the public land areas. It followed that to a T and it, it's, it, like I said, there's not even the one time that we were there, there was a, there was a camper parked in the spot, um, where I had never seen anybody park before. And so the, the terms of hunting, which is awesome. I mean, I honestly, I want to see, I want to see as many people get into hunting as I can. It, it's more people on our team. Uh, and I know people that feel different because there's less area to hunt if that's the case, but the, w- the way I feel is the more people that are out there hunting, um, you know, the, the more people that are on our team about, how to do this and, and do it. Now, with that being said, there are people that don't go about it the right way. Like you said, throw trash out there, you know, shoot anything under the sun. You know, I saw movement. So I shot into the brush. Um, there, there's always those type of guys. Um, you know, those are the type of guys you don't want to go on the trip with those, you know, those you, you want to, if you, if you're a type of guy who wants to go on a trip and have a bunch of beers and, and, you know, maybe two nights out of your seven, you, you don't wake up the next morning, you sleep in, Hey, that's fine. Just find somebody who wants to do that kind of hunting when you go on that trip. Um, you know, when I go, I need a vacation for my vacation. When I get back, like I I'm, I'm exhausted, um, work my tail off, uh, you know, and, and that's the other thing too, is that, you know, I never put, uh, uh, a tape measure on my, on, on my antlers. I don't care really what it comes down to a score. Um, you know, granted, I want to shoot the biggest buck I could possibly shoot on any type of trip, but a lot of it comes down to some of the memories. Um, like, uh, I was telling you earlier, my daughter shot a five point It was her first buck. She's nine years old. One of the coolest experiences of my life. And, you know, the deer scores 35 inches. I don't know, you know, it's something absolutely ridiculous. And, Um, but you know, so, so some of those with those hunts, you know, comes down to memories and stuff like that, but social media, you know, on X maps, hunt wise, all that kind of stuff. If you had a secret spot, it's not really much of a secret anymore. Um, it, it really comes down to hunting areas that are hard to get to, um, some areas that are overlooked. 
Um, those are always in, those are sometimes, you know, I, actually that 12 point I shot in Ohio, I shot it about 250 yards from the parking spot. Every, I, we had other guys hunting it and they'd walk right by and we saw bucks there all day long. Um, so there, you know, there's all of those kind of technology. I talked about e-scouting. Everybody can do that. You get Google Earth, you get on there, you can start doing uh, um, e-scouting. Um, all of that has enhanced our ability to be more successful in the field and give everybody opportunities. Um, I don't, everybody likes an easy hunt. Sure. Um, but like I said, some of the, my favorite hunts I've ever been on are those hard ones. Um, we went to the year we went to North Dakota, um, that year they switched the non-resident from being able to shoot mule deer or whitetail, um, to whitetail only. And, uh, we were actually, when we had planned all this out the year before we were planning on going into a more mule deer area early season, we wanted to go after uh, velvet mule deer is what we really wanted to go for. Well, we had kind of had all these things into place where we were kind of committed to going over to this side of the state. And when we got over there, man, we, uh, me and my cousin, we spent two solid days looking for whitetails anywhere else. Like, and it was, there was no other whitetails other than this one area where every non-resident hunter was hunting because it was all whitetails and it was tough. It was, there was guys everywhere. Um, the game warden was around there daily because why not? There's 50 non-resident hunters hunting, you know, everywhere. And we saw them give guys tickets for, you know, driving their truck too far back and stuff like that. But, um, I ended up, we went one for four. I, I was the only one who shot one. I shot an eight point and it was probably about a, I don't know, hundred, 110 inch eight point and I proud as a peacock. And it goes down as, you know, one of my most memorable hunts on public land somewhere else. Um, but, uh, just because the, the rack wasn't big, doesn't mean on how successful the hunt actually was. Yeah. That was one of the things that I think you open with in your book, um, is that the success of a hunt isn't, uh, I forget how you uh, highlighted it, but isn't based on like the inches of the rack, but more like on the memories made. And I feel like when we hunt around home um, this example of like when I went uh, up with my family to our camp in the UP and it was a rifle hunt and all the kids were there and I hunted uh, probably just as hard as I would have given any other circumstances, but it, the outcome really didn't matter. It was for the kids and, you know, you, I wanted to get back to be with my daughter to be like, Hey, what did you want to do? Did you see anything out the window? Did you, you know, that, that sort of experience. And that was a more uh, fulfilling hunt than a lot of the all day grinded out sits where you're seeing a bunch of deer, but they're not the deer or you're, you know, you walked in all this way and you scouted and you saw a deer and, you know, it's just way different. And so when you talk about those types of different hunts, like when we went on our first elk hunt, it was completely DIY, you know, a, a local told us, go here, here's some spots to check out. There you go. And, you know, we wanted to hear an elk, see an elk and get an opportunity. And we got all of that in spades. And it was one of the most memorable trips, but we didn't come home with anything. And, you know, obviously there's just, you know, you spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of vacation time away from your family. But we often forget that, you know, just because we can't post that trophy picture on Instagram or whatever, that doesn't mean that it wasn't a successful hunt, you know? So a little bit of your insight on that. Yeah. I, I mean, I completely agree. I mean, it's honestly going back to your social media question. I think a lot of that ruins, it ruins a lot of, uh, you know, you get, there's always going to be negative feedback period, no matter what you do. Um, I've always said, if you're not getting negative feedback, you're not doing something right. Cause there, you, you're just going to always get that. Um, 
and so it's, I, I watched one of my younger cousins growing up and, uh, you know, he shoot a six point and it was his first deer and he got razzed at school for shooting a little buck and stuff like that. And, you know, part of that is kind of ruined, um, some of the, the expectation of what the real purpose is of hunting and it kind of takes away from a lot of that. And, um, you know, like you said, with your elk hunt, you know, one of my, my definition of a successful hunt is that one person in my group that I put a hunt together has an opportunity. That's it. It, it isn't that we all fill tags. It isn't that we all kill deer, you know, granted the hunts that we kill all kill deer. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a home run and, you know, there's, there's definitely some more memories there. Um, but, um, three years ago I drew my first Iowa tag and it, it was one of those hunts where it's hardcore. Like we're, you know, we're hunting all day, every single day. Um, I ended up making three trips to Iowa. I hunted 16 days. I ended up hitting a buck and not getting it. Um, and I, I saw 80, over 85 different bucks, um, just had one of the most memorable experiences. Um, I drew my Iowa tag this year and went out with the same buddy and we were talking about it and he's like, yeah, we didn't shoot, we didn't shoot, uh, three years ago, but he goes, I want to trade that hunt for anything. Like it was, it was absolutely memorable. It was the, the experiences that we had, um, the people that we ran into, just all around, it was, it was, it was so memorable and I'll never forget it. And that's for sure. And, uh, um, and I hunted my tail off. Now there's other trips too, where, you know, you take your, you take your kid out, you take your daughter out and, you know, you hunt for 15 minutes and, <laughs> you know, they're, they're like, I want to go, I want, I'm cold. I want to go in and it, it's still memorable, but in a different way. Um, so it's not, it's definitely not all about killing deer. It's not all about antlers. Um, you know, granted that's the goal. That's what you're setting out to do. And, uh, if you're not setting out to do that, then you're basically just going out and traveling and sightseeing and hiking. Um, but the real, the real success story is, you know, you have memories, you have a good time and, and you have fun. Um, and you know, that's what it really comes down to. Um, my dad and I have gone and, uh, we've taken trips to Nebraska, um, it was a really hard trip, but it, I got to spend time with my dad one-on-one -on -one for an entire week. He ended up shooting a small eight point, um, towards the end of the week, we hunted our tail off, but it was, you know, it, it was very memorable. It was, and it, it, it doesn't come down to the inches of the antler. And, uh, and that, and that goes for a long way. I mean, anybody who, anybody who has shot a buck, can tell you that entire story, probably too long of a story about that first buck too detailed because it's so memorable. And, you know, so anytime, the one thing I like to do is I like to go to these new States. I like to, you know, I, I, my wife knows my goal is to hunt or fish in all 50 States, you know, whether I do it or not, I don't know. Um, but you know, I did a hog hunt in Florida um, she wants to go on spring break next year down to Myrtle beach. All I'm doing is looking for a Turkey hunt, um, something to, you know, go do down there. Um, you know, there's, there's all different reasons why a hunt will be memorable and it doesn't always have to be for the size of the antler that you're on the hunt with. And so interestingly enough, one of our Patreons had asked about hog hunting, right? So is there a, a budget way to do that or how, how would you plan that hunt? So, all right. I've only planned one hog hunt and we, they, my family wanted to go to Florida for spring break. And I was like, all right. I'm like, I can't sit next to a pool or a beach for seven days and not go absolutely crazy. So I took the same mentality on how I do my deer hunts. Um, I actually uh, reached out to the place we were staying at the Airbnb and knew if the lady knew anybody. And she actually did. Um, so she knew a guy who did uh, um, airboat, uh, bow fishing off an airboat. And that intrigued me. And I thought about uh, down that line, but I started talking to him about hog hunting. We kind of worked through some things. He had a buddy that wanted to get into guiding and hadn't really had any clients. And 
it wasn't going to work because they were picking the groves of where we could hunt and I wanted to bow hunt only. Um, and, uh, so they, the farmer wouldn't let me hunt in the daylight. And so we could only hunt at night because they're picking the groves. So that didn't work out. So he sent me into a, a high fence ranch. Um, and so I called them and I was, I told them, I'm like, look, I, I don't want to kill one in the fence. And if guys want to kill hogs in the fence and, you know, kill deer in the fence, whatever, Hey, they're still hunting. It's still legal. That that's, that's their prerogative. It's, it's just not for me. And so I called him up and I was like, you know, I want to bow hunt and I want to hunt free range. And he's like, we can do that. And so they own a bunch of acres outside the high fence with a bunch of hogs on them. Uh, I ended up not shooting one. I, I, I missed one. I took a shot at 35 yards just as twilight was setting in. And it, it uh, when I got there, you could tell that they weren't really, they're more for the guys inside the high fence, but I ended up calling down there, talking to them, you know, telling them I wanted to bow hunt. And I didn't, you know, it wasn't one of those situations where I could really beat them up with price. Um, cause I was kind of tied down to the area I was going. I wasn't willing to walk away and go hunt public land. Uh, but it ended up, I think it was still only like, I don't know, 250 bucks or 300 bucks. It wasn't anything crazy. Um, I ended up seeing two hogs. They really never came. They, they never put stuff in the feeder. I was hunting out of some rinky ladder stand. Like it, it was, I was just completely out of my own world. It, it wasn't, but if I had to do it again, I'd probably still call these guys and uh, you know, they would uh, um, I know a lot more going into it now. And the same thing with deer hunting, take that same expectation is you know your first year you guys might you you might have four guys going you might not do anything any good um but the following year you've already learned so much going into it than what you know for the next year and the same thing so if i ever went and did it again you know i would uh i'd probably talk to that bow hunt guy or the bow fishing guy again and try to get in to uh however I could do some of that stuff or whatnot, but it's, uh, you know, not everything goes according to plan. Just because you pay money doesn't mean you're going to kill something. Um, and, uh, it's just, uh, hog hunting is, uh, I don't know. I I don't know much about it. I'm not going to be the first one to tell you I know anything about it. And, uh, it, uh, I just took the same mentality of how I put together a deer hunt. But like I said, I was tied into the area, I, it, it was, I had the small window, you know, Tuesday to Thursday where I could break away from the family for a day and uh, try to go do something to put my mind at ease and get in the woods. But it was, it was still fun. I'd still do it again. Um, but uh, the guys who hunted in the high fence. So when I got there, there was four rifle hunters and they were hunting high fence and they went sighted in the rifles and the guy took me on the gator and we drove outside the fence way back into the swamp. And he dropped me off and said, good luck. And, uh, I heard all of them shoot in the first 15, 20 minutes and they had hogs hanging when I got back. And, you know, I, uh, I'm okay with that. It, it, it doesn't bother me at all. It doesn't bother me one bit that I didn't get one. They hunt a high fence and they got it. You know, uh, that doesn't bother me. That's, that's my hunting style. And that's what I prefer. So in your uh, hunting style, like, uh, what is your hunting, like preferred mobile type setup? Cause it sounds like your mobile public land style, uh, isn't that much different from, from what we do. So, so what is your setup and then what's your bow setup as well? So I, uh, I'm kind of like, I like, as I like to have the most tools I've, I've had a guy tell me that, Oh, I got rid of all my hang on stands because I got a saddle and he's like, I'll never hunt on anything else. And I said, okay, you know, so I ended up, I've got a latitude saddle and, uh, I love it. Um, there's a time and place for it and I use it frequently. Um, but I didn't get rid of all my other setups. Um, I have a lone wolf climber, hand climber, um, really light. I, like you said earlier, I videotape everything I do. So I've got camera equipment, I've got camera arms, I've got all that kind of stuff. So light is very important to me. Um, but I also have, I have a lone wolf, uh, hang on with sticks, um, that mount onto it. If I'm going in for an all day sit, 
me personally, I take my, uh, I take my lone wolf. I sit in the stand. Um, if, uh, if I can, um, if I want, if I might be mobile, like, uh, if I'm going to go and I might hunt this area for two hours and I might get down and go jump. If, you know, bucks are rotten and I see all the movement, you know, 250 yards away, I don't really know, have a game plan going into an area. I take my saddle. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I shot my buck in Indiana on public land out of my saddle this year um, just because it was so far back in and I just needed to be as light as possible to get back in there. Um, yeah, I had to go through a swamp. I was, I was wet up to my crotch getting into the stand in the morning. Um, so, you know, it just all like you hunt Southern Ohio. There's a lot of climber trees down there. All right. I'm going to, I, you know, I, I prefer my sticks and my hang on, um, light hang on or my saddle over my climber. Now, actually, I think this year I haven't used my climber one time. I've kind of gotten away from it a little bit. Um, but, uh, there's still a time and place when I go on these trips, I take my saddle. Um, I take my platform for that and I take my hang on with my sticks that are on the stand. And then I also take my, uh, my climber. And then I usually always take another set of sticks and a hang on, um, if I got a spot that I might go hang that right when I get there, not think about it for three days and go bounce into it. If I had that spot previously scouted. So honestly, I, I, I use it all. I, and I'm not, uh, I'm not married to one or the other. If, uh, if I kill a deer out of a saddle, if I kill a deer out of hang on, or if I kill a deer on the ground, doesn't matter to me. It, uh, um, it just, it's all the time and place on kind of the setup. I love the saddle, um, over the climber only because I like very covered up trees. I like getting in those little bit of thicker trees where you can get a little way with movement. And that's because of my videotaping. Um, I, you know, I can get away with a little bit more movement if I've got that cover, if I'm on a, with a climber, and I'm on a telephone pole that I got to climb up with no branches on, you know, you're, you know, you're always, you know, thinking about the backdrop and what's there and what, what, you know, what kind of movements you can get away with. So there, there's all that, that kind of comes into play, but um, yeah, like I, I, I love my saddle um, just as much as I love all the other ones, but they're just uh, as much as I hate to say the, the phrase, it's just another tool in the toolbox where, you know, if it's uh, making me a successful hunter, I'm going to use it. And which latitude saddle? Uh, I got the cla- uh, is it the classic. I think it's classic. Okay. Yeah. That's what I run. Um, yep. John runs the method. He's got the method yep. two XL. My brother's been running the method. Um, hunted out of a lot of saddles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I put it in the backyard the first year I got it and, you know, practice on shooting out of it. And it's awesome. It's, uh, it's great. I did. However, I did a all day sit, no knee pads. One of the first years of hunting with a saddle, I did an all day sit down in Ohio and I was miserable, man. I was absolutely miserable. And uh, that's where I was like, all right, if I do an all, like, I don't have the extra back harness or anything like that. I'm like, which would help and knee pads would help. Um, but uh, I'm like, if I'm doing all day sit, I, I'd like to sit down for a couple hours when things are dead, which I stand, I would say when I hunt, I'm standing probably 80% of the time anyways, just because one of my rules is if, if I ever look at my phone, whether it be tax or you're bored and you're actually looking at your phone, I have to be standing because when I'm, when I'm recording and videotaping, it's uh, standing up is one less step I have to do. If I get caught off guard, if a deer's coming in. Um, so it, uh, yeah, I sat in that saddle all day long and I, my back hurt pretty bad by the end hmm. of the day. And that's when I was like, eh, I should buy that extra back brace if I decide to do that again. <laughs> and so what bow are you shooting and what's your arrow setup and all that? Yeah. So I I'm shooting an elite ritual. Um, absolutely love it. And then I'm shooting, uh, um, uh, victory, uh, vapes, uh, arrows. Um, I, uh, I actually was at a film festival and I won a half dozen of those victory arrows and uh, I was shooting some other type of arrow and I was shooting my bow and I picked up those and it, it blew through my target. The penetration was insane. So I ended up using those. Um, I shoot uh, 
this year I actually made a change and I shoot G fives, uh, those mecha meets. Um, I, I was blown away. I, I, I usually don't change my broadheads. I was, I was a big rage guy. I know there's, you know, polarized views on rages, uh, through the internet and social medias. Um, but, uh, that, that's basically my setup. Um, I got a CB, uh, uh, site and, uh, uh, QAD drop away. Um, and I shoot four finger release. Um, a lot of that four finger release for me is because of recording. If I shoot a wrist strap, you're, you know, the deer moves and you got to move the camera. You got to unclick, move the camera and then click back on. Whereas my four finger can hang on my D loop and I can move the camera and then just grab the re release again. Um, and I still see a lot of guys videotaping that are using the re release, uh, the wrist strap. And, uh, you know, it's so much easier to not be able to use that, but I, I prefer the four finger, um, release over that as well. Okay. So, um, for the listeners, like where can they find the book? Where can they follow along with you? You know, if they got questions, they want more information, like how can they, reach out to you where can they get this stuff yeah so the book is on amazon um exclusively it's uh the non-resident hunter um obviously by blake mallory and uh honey, how to destination deer hunt on a budget um and i think it's 9.99 right now and uh um it's also free on if you have an amazon subscription through kindle um so it's free that that avenue um, and then anybody can ever reach out to me. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Um, and then also uh, a lot of uh, my videos um, are on Michigan Whitetail Pursuit. Um, the buck I killed this year in Michigan is on there. The, uh, the one I killed in Indiana and the one I killed in Iowa aren't yet. Um, there was, uh, we come out with Michigan Whitetail Pursuit on the road. Um, and we usually come out with those after the season and put together a DVD on that as well. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, when I came into Michigan whitetail pursuit, a lot of it was, you know, solely based on Michigan. And, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of in-depth conversations about, uh, you know, all the non non-resident hunting I do all the out of state stuff I do and how we kind of wanted to pursue that Avenue of having those videos out there. Um, you know, I had conversations that I'll do my own thing, you know, cause I videotape all those hunts that I go on. Uh, but uh, we ended up, you know, a lot of guys from Michigan are always looking to go out of state and do other things. And uh, so we kind of opened up that Avenue of uh, Michigan whitetail pursuit on the road. Um, so we have, uh, I think we have one DV at D out one season of on the road as of right now. And uh, um, we have some more episodes that are out there that we didn't put together a DVD last year because of COVID on the road. Uh, I think there was only a few of us that actually went out and actually got some stuff that were out of state, but this year we'll, we definitely got some stuff in the works of uh, hunts on video for out of the state. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on. And I think um, people are really going to, uh, I mean, the fact that it's free for Amazon Kindle and, and $10 going into the holiday season, I mean, 10 bucks stocking yeah. stuff or like tell your wife tell your girlfriend i didn't i didn't write this to get rich or anything like that uh my dad if well you know i was talking to him i was like man i should write a book about how i put these together and he's like uh yeah you should and <laughs> i just i just i just did it and honestly i did it for myself i just i i wrote it you know every book that sells i'm like all right that's kind of cool you know like <laughs> i i'm I, by no means we're, you know, trying to make a living on writing this book, but, um, there's, there's some details in there about some areas that I haunt and, you know, I, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm an open book. Uh, you know, if someone asked me a question, I, I tell them exactly, you know, I might give them the pin to where I was hunting, but I, I don't, I tell people what County I was hunting in and whatnot. And, you know, I, I, uh, I love to see more people getting into it and more people taking advantage of the opportunity that's out there. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on and thanks for taking the time. Yeah, I appreciate it, Adam. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm.